Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Justice Committee's 19th meeting of 2017. We have apologies from the convener, Margaret Mitchell, who's absent on other parliamentary business, and we welcome back Alexander Stewart as her substitute. Before we begin formal business today, um, I'd like to make men brief mention of last night's horrific events in Manchester. The thoughts and prayers of the committee are with those affected by the blast and especially the families of those who lost their lives. Flags are flying at half mast today at the Parliament as a mark of our sympathy and sorrow. Today's evidence session is of course with the fire and rescue services and events such as last night's remind us of, their crucial work, of the crucial work the emergency services perform at times like these, putting themselves in harm's way in service of the public. Before beginning our evidence session, I want to underline on behalf of the committee just how much that work is appreciated. So agenda item one is an evidence session on the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. The Parliament has a duty to keep under review the operation of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012, which amongst other things led to the setting up of the SFRS and we're taking evidence today in furtherance of that duty. So can I welcome today Alistair Hay, Chief Officer of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Pat Waters, Chair of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Board, Chris McGlone, Executive Council Member for Scotland, Fire Brigades Union, Derek Jackson, Brent Branch Secretary, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service of Unison Scotland. So we'll go straight to questions and if I can open up um, with just a general question. It's four years since the SFRS uh, was formed as a single service. Um, can you tell me what you think maybe some of the most uh, challenging aspects of the transformation has been and just generally how you feel it's, it's working? Open to anyone to answer first. Maybe if I could um, mm. okay, open up. Um, I think certainly um, over the past four years, and remember it is only four years, we have um, achieved in conjunction with our colleagues and the trade union and our staff a tremendous amount. Um, we, we set out in this journey to um, ensure that what we had was the proper foundations to actually build on a world-class service for the safety of the people of Scotland. And I think we've achieved um, that initial building. Um, is not finished by any manner of means and there is still a, a journey to be on. But we have those foundations right. There has been many trials during that particular period of major events where um, the, the Fire and Rescue Service has, has stood up. By and large, I think the likes of the, the four years ago, it was a brave decision to set up the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. It was probably the right decision to set up the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and it's brought um, a, our, our service together. We have spent that four years of integration um, ensuring that what we get is, is a single service that's delivered very, very locally. Although we are a national service, we are still a local service. And we have, we have strived to try and achieve that. Our communication with our partners, both in local authorities and elsewhere within the public sector, and our partnership working with other partners within the public sector is, I, I believe, outstanding, but still can be improved on. Um, so we have started the journey, we are on the way in that journey, we believe that so far it has been a success in how we have managed to achieve that. I think that's down to the partnership we've had with our staff and the cooperation we've had with our staff and other partners. I don't know if anyone else would like to add Anyone else? Yeah. Chris, on you go. Sorry, yes, uh, uh, yeah, but now the, the Fire Brigade Union would uh, absolutely, you know, echo the, the, what Pat has said, the recognition of the role employees and our members have played in ensuring we continue to provide a world-class all-hazards emergency service, especially, you know, uh, against the, the current backdrop, the, the fiscal challenges, the, the, the operational challenges that clearly exist out there and are evolving all the time. Uh, the government in the response to the, the Christie Commission going back a few years, and Pat will probably remember this because I think he sat on it, I think hit the nail on the head that transformational change can only be successful with a broad base of popular consent. And the FBU certainly believes that that consent uh, begins at home with its employees. Uh, and I would echo the, the, the fact that we have worked very, very closely with the service over the last four years. There's been some very challenging times, some difficult decisions to make, 
The, the fiscal background is the worst, I think, we've seen in living memory. So we absolutely understand the difficult decisions and choices that the service have to make. We believe now that we are entering a, a, a new phase of uh, the service. I think we, uh, we have not completed the integration of the eight services, and I think there's still a, a, a fair amount of work to be done on that, and I'd be happy to expand on that later in the session. Uh, and obviously, the, the Minister has indicated that we are now entering a, a transformational phase, and that's why I think it's key to bringing employees along with us. I think we've got a lot of work to do there, uh, and I think we need to get around the table and address some of the issues that I don't think have been addressed with our employees. And I think our employees uh, at the moment uh, are disappointed with uh, the direction that the service has gone in in relation to, to their employment. So I think, there's, I think there's some fantastic work has taken place. There's been some really good partnership work taking place. I think we're now entering an incredibly difficult period for the service after the first four years, but certainly the FPU and I, you know, I give the commitment now we are more than, more than welcome, uh, sorry, more than, uh, you know, happy to sit around the table with the service and continue to work in partnership with the service to try and, you know, meet the challenges ahead and, uh, and identify the solutions, I think, to some of the issues and problems we've got at the moment. Would you like to expand a bit on those issues, what the importance that you might be? Uh, I think when we... Uh, I think when we took on uh, the amalgamation of eight uh, different, very different organisations, there was some pro initially some sort of pressing issues I think we had to deal with. There was uh, huge differences in the cultures of those organisations and the cultures within the employees and the, the manner in which you know, we went about providing that service. I think there was cultural barriers obviously to break down, not just for the, not just for the service but from the union's point of view as well. And we are continuing to try and do that. You know, we're looking at restructuring the, re the union in Scotland to more closely align it with the service delivery areas. I think for us, but the biggest, the biggest issue probably was the, the eight sets of different terms and conditions, pay terms and conditions, which are continuing to cause us problems now. I think there should have been far more consideration given to the difficulties that you know, would have been caused by bringing those sets of conditions together. I think there should have been uh, consideration in relation to transitional funding to address the difficulties that the service would have met in trying to bring those sets of conditions together because there's a, a wide disparity of pay terms and conditions, especially when you come down to things like continuous professional development, uh, additional responsibility allowances, and all the various raft of different allowances that have essentially been locally negotiated through collective bargaining over the last 30 years. That is now, I think, causing us, certainly from the union's point of view, the biggest problem and the biggest issues. Uh, I'm running out of excuses. Uh, I've, I've, I'm now, you know, struggling to explain to our employees and our members why we still haven't addressed these issues and why four or five years down the road we are still squabbling over, you know, elements within that. Okay, thank you. Mr Jackson, would you like to? Yeah, well, just like what my colleague says here, we, we've kind of, it is challenging uh, in our, with, with eight services going into one. For support staff's side of things, we've uh, actually went through new T's and C's. Uh, that's been challenging as well. We've, we've went through a job evaluation process along uh, a long process for, for uh, job evaluation as well. And basically on that, we've, we've had people come in and go on, uh, just purely down to how it's affected them, how it impacts uh, on individuals, even strategic uh, lay as well, where people have been moved from one place to another, buildings have been closed and that. that's, that's been challenging as well. And basically for our, we, we've still got the same sort of issue there, the fact that the disparity and, and pay, even going through a job evaluation and a new pay and grading system, there's people who, for the first couple of years, were always chasing the people at the top and they still find themselves in that position for the next few years. Uh, pay protection for the staff are, are in detriment. That ceased on 27th of February this year, and that's had a quite big impact on us as well, the fact that we've got some staff in the region of 
possibly £9,000 in detriment. Uh, and that's where we're kind of looking for some sort of commitment as well, that can these people win detriment that the service can do something for them to get them out of detriment as, as quick as they can. So it's, uh, it's challenging and the financial constraints on it as well. That's, that's, that's no easy, but it's, it's been a long, hard road so far and it's not finished yet. Eh, so. Okay, thank you. Mr Hay, would you? First of all, uh, Kabir, can I thank you for your, the thoughts that you expressed for the, uh, the victims and their families uh, following last night's tragic events in Greater Manchester. Uh, and, and, of course, to a lesser extent, um, it's, it was traumatic for all the emergency service workers, and, and I'm really pleased to hear you um, expressing the gratitude for the work that frontline staff do day in, day out throughout the country. I can only begin to imagine uh, some of the horrific uh, scenes they had to witness last night and deal with, so thank you for that. Um, I welcome the opportunity uh, to come along here today and to discuss the progress that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has made uh, in the past four years. Um, I think you have to remember we are still a very young service. Four years is not a long time. Uh, and to give voice to some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that we uh, face in the future. Um, I've got no doubt at all that the creation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has been good for Scotland. Uh, it has been um, acknowledged by many independent uh, observers that it has been the public sector uh, success story. Uh, we continue to meet the expectations uh, of reform, which were clearly set out, uh, which was to protect frontline service delivery and indeed the outcomes. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always very proud of the work that firefighters do uh, and their, their colleagues in support services. And if you think the number of fire deaths in Scotland for the first four years of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are the lowest uh, in Scottish history, the lowest in record, I think that's testament to, to the work and the continuing uh, journey. There were 356 fire stations in Scotland before reform, and there are still 356 fire stations. Uh, so in terms of meeting uh, what the intentions of reform were, I think we can clearly indicate the, um, the success that we've had on that journey. I think the two biggest challenges, to answer your question directly, uh, have been the fiscal challenges. Uh, we have taken £55.3 million out of the cost base of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in the last four years. Uh, we've actually been running for five years because we had six months of... Uh, almost shadow, where we had a limited amount of finance, and we have delivered against our saving targets every year. We have presented a balanced uh, budget, and our, our accounts have uh, been approved on every occasion. Uh, so I think that's something that was very challenging, but we need to be, we need to be proud of. Um, I would agree with my trade union colleagues, uh, people. Uh, this has been extremely difficult for people. Uh, you know, as Derek just said, if you close a premise where people have worked for maybe 20, 30 years, you might only be asking them to move, you know, five miles down the road. But sometimes we're asking them to move 40, 50 miles down the road. Uh, that is extremely challenging. Uh, now, we have not been able to duck uh, any of the tough decisions in relation to uh, staff issues, but we have absolutely tried to do it as empathetically as we possibly can. So money and people have been the two biggest challenges. Uh, I would also agree with Chris. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that remains for us in relation to our Fire Brigade Union staff is that we need to harmonise uh, the terms and conditions of service. Perhaps if I can uh, you know, just expand on that slightly, we have national terms and conditions of service. Uh, it was more pressing uh, to, to do the harmonisation piece uh, with our colleagues uh, within the support trade unions because we didn't have that national basis. Uh, the, the disparity in, in rates of pay, you know, leave, all that type of stuff was enormous. Uh, we have dealt with that. In terms of the, uh, our, our uniform colleagues, we have national terms and conditions of service, but as Chris said, there is quite a lot of disparity in relation to particularly allowances. Um, we have not harmonised those as yet. Um, but Chris has acknowledged on several occasions the excellent work that has gone on uh, in, in, in relation to doing that. Uh, we have a partnership advisory group where if things are not progressing, 
Uh, it can be escalated to myself as the chief, uh, Pat as the chair, and, and one of our colleagues, Kirsty Diamond, uh, the, the vice chair is sit, sitting behind us. Uh, we acknowledge that we should try and do that uh, as quickly as possible. It was our intention to have had that done prior to uh, the start of this financial year. Uh, we had challenges around the budget setting process, but you know, that, that, that's understandable and accepted. Um, but what we've been seeking to do is, is look to the future, uh, look at service redesign to meet the challenges the country faces, uh, and in delivering uh, service redesign, that would also require a re-evaluation of the role of firefighters that perhaps could have lifted all these um, issues out. We haven't been able to achieve that uh, you know, just yet, but we continue to discuss it, and I can absolutely assure the committee that we will now give priority uh, and, and uh, to work progressively with the Fire Brigade Union uh, to deal with this last outstanding issue uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you. A supplementary for Mary Fee, uh, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to a point that you made, Mr Jackson, about the pay protection coming to an end in February of this year. I wonder if you could expand on that and, and give us some idea of how many staff are affected. Are they clustered in a particular grading? And do you have an end date for resolving the issue? It was after uh, job evaluation, as we said, and basically uh, the people in detriment, I think, part or the chief might come in and uh, sort of just, I think off the top of my head, it was roughly about 27% of the staff were in detriment. And basically, the, the pay protection run up to 27th of February this year. Uh, I've not got figures as to sort of say how many people or percentage is still in detriment. Uh, there's been a few of them have left the service due to that. Uh, and basically, there's a few sort of directorates or key areas where we've actually had to introduce market allowances to try and bridge that gap for external to try and encourage people from outside to come in and, and even to retain uh, current staff. Uh, so it was roughly 27% of our staff that was, and that was uh, in the beginning. As I say, I, I, I don't know how many are, are remaining out of 27%. Okay. Mr Hay, can, can you give us any more clarity on that? I think I can. Um, the I think what we have to remember as well, we, 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 had a, we got a collective agreement uh, in terms of the harmonisation uh, with uh, um, support staff trade unions. They balloted their members. Uh, on the first occasion, they rejected uh, the harmonisation process. On the second occasion, by a very narrow margin, they did accept it. So we, we, we went through a proper harmonisation process. Um, it was 227 employees actually uh, ended up in, in detriment at the end of this, uh, which you know, Derek rightly says is roughly 27% you know, of our support staff. Uh, we have put in, uh, and we continue to, to, to have, a number of change management policies uh, to try and support staff uh, to perhaps move into other roles within the organisation uh, where they can recover uh, some of the detriment that, they've, that, that, that they have experienced. Um, Picking up on the point about staff turnover there, uh, our staff turnover within uh, support services actually sits at 2.5%, which is actually remarkably low. Uh, the average within uh, the public sector in Scotland, I understand, is around about 8%, uh, and across industry as a whole, it's around about 15%. So, you know, I don't in any way, shape or form uh, um, underestimate how difficult it is for staff that find themselves in detriment, in, sorry, in, in, in detriment. but I think um, the fact that we seek to be an employer of choice is evidenced by the fact that our turnover is so slow, is, is, is so low, and we, you know, we are committed to try and help staff as much as we possibly can. You have an anticipated end date to resolve the situation we, we, for, for some people, we may never resolve that, that detriment. Uh, but what I can say is we have a number of policies that are very supportive of staff to try and help them to perhaps move into other roles that will help them. And of course, you know, a lot depends upon uh, what the pay, uh, you know, we've currently got a, um, we're in negotiation at this moment in time over this year's um, pay settlement for our support staff. And of course, one of the, the, the things that lifts staff out of detriment is their annual pay rises. 
Uh, but what that, for the foreseeable future, you know, it looks like around about 1%. I'm not you know, tr trying to circumvent the negotiations, but that's what it looks like. So I can't give you an exact you know, date on that because there's, there, there's a number of factors involved in it. But what I can reassure you is we are working with staff uh, you know, to try and help them where we possibly can. And no consideration was given to extending the period of pay protection to alleviate the, the, the detriment that these members of staff are suffering? This was all the, the chair's looking to come in, so if, if I could just say that you know, this was all agreed, the length of time, uh, within uh, a, a collective agreement, uh, and it was part of a whole package of measures that were put on that were put onto the table. Can I say that the, the I mean, the, the negotiations was um, we, there was a clear understanding there was people in, in detriment, some of them quite severely in detriment, and that's why there was a period of pay protection built in um, to that. We also gave the commitment to the trade union that we'd work with the trade union and with the staff in detriment where possible to find alternative employment or to find retraining opportunities so that it would lift people out of that detriment or even soften the detriment where it was, it was quite sizable. Um, that's an ongoing process. Um, to say that we've got an end date. No, we don't have an end date because that's a, a process that we'll look to try and achieve. The, the agreement was for 18 months of pay protection. That 18 months came to an end at the, at the, at the start of this year. Uh, and so therefore people did revert to what was the agreed level of pay for that particular job. Um, but we continue to work with staff and we are a trade union representative to ensure that what we get is proper uh, examination of where opportunities arise for our staff within the support region. Thank you. Thank you, King Dean. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. I think we'll come on um, in, in due course to some of the issues around, I think Mr Waters, you talked about a national service delivering locally and, and how that's achieved as well as some of the issues around capacity. But it strikes me that in setting the scene, you've talked about um, uh, fiscal difficulties, about <coughs> difficulties in terms of um, variability in terms and conditions, um, a, a, as well as uh, I think some of the issues around um, the, the physical infrastructure of the service. Now, all of those um, have um, a, an echo in Police Scotland, but it appears that the concerns both internally within the organisation and more widely within the public uh, around the, the process that the fire service has gone through have not um, been of the same magnitude as we've seen in relation to the establishment of Police Scotland. I mean, do you have any uh, ideas as to why that may be the case? What have you been able to do that in Police Scotland it's, it's proved more difficult? I mean, IT would be another example, I think, that you, you, you cited where issues have arisen in terms of the establishment of Police Scotland that, that you appear to have managed to navigate um, more successfully without the, the kind of headlines that uh, Police Scotland has, has garnered? Um, if, 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 if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I know other colleagues, we can't speak for Police Scotland. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about Police Scotland's uh, um, set up and how they've approached the, the reform process. I think for us, um, the, there has been two key things. Um, Audit Scotland very helpfully produced a document which was called Best Practice Guide to Public Service Mergers, uh, which in, in, indicated uh, a pathway to delivering success. It was based on evidence from previous public sector mergers, so we used that. Uh, and you know, specifically in terms of you know, the financial challenges and, and it was clear from the start there was going to be financial cha challenges. Uh, there was a saving target set for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. It was in the, in the financial memorandum that underpinned, you know, the Police and Fire Reform Act. So, in a sense, the, the savings target was uh, is established for Police Scotland, but. but Presumably, where there was a difference is that, looking at the figures, you've reduced headcount in terms of, of, of officers as well as um, as well as staff. Did you have more flexibility in what you were able to do in, in, in implementing that best practice that, that yeah. wasn't there because of the the, um, the, yeah. the, the government commitments and well, police officers? Yeah, again, I emphasise I can't speak for Police Scotland. You know, so we followed the best practice. Uh, guide, you know, we knew what the saving targets actually uh, were that we had to meet. Uh, we set out a, a critical savings pathway that would take us up to 1920 uh, and we looked at the main areas in which we would be able to uh, take cost out of the organisation and absolutely that involves reducing the headcount, so we did have a flexibility to do that. Uh, what it also in in included was 
uh, rationalising our assets and rationalising the amount of contracts that had been set by the eight different services. We've looked to a degree at shared services and we've streamlined process. So for each of the, the years up until 1920, we were very clear against these main categories what we would be trying to achieve, and that's what set us on the, on, on, on the right path. So for us, it was following that best practice guidance uh, and it was systematically planning. Uh, but I think the other major success factor, uh, Chris spoke earlier about uh, building a willing coalition uh, for change and building that willing coalition did have to start internally within the organisation, having a very clear focus for staff on what we were trying to achieve uh, and why it was necessary. Uh, and, you know, as has been highlighted, that has not been without difficulty for people in four years, although it seems it's gone by in a flash for me, uh, if you're one of the staff that's directly impacted, I'm sure it seems like a long time we've not resolved the, their, their issues. But I would have to give credit to uh, you know, our staff in particular uh, and the work that we've done in partnership with the trade unions uh, in helping us to uh, follow that best practice guidance and take those uh, costs out of the organisation. And we have kept a very strong focus on what's important. And I always say there's two absolutes for me, and that's community safety and firefighter safety. Uh, and I think building on what we have in common, as opposed to what separates us, has been you know, one, one of the things that's helped us on this journey. So, yeah. yeah no, I'm quite, happy. I'm quite happy to come back on that as well, uh, maybe in more practical terms. Uh, I think there's definitely been a different public perception between what's happened in the, the, the single police service and the single uh, fire service. I think a lot of that is to, uh, is to do with the fact that the, the public, I think, are very acutely aware of a lot of the problems and issues that have, that have arisen as a result of bringing those eight, eight uh, police forces together. Uh, it has been played out very publicly, I think, in the press. Uh, I've been very heavily criticised myself since I came into post for not essentially doing the same as uh, my counterpart in the Scottish uh, Police Federation, Callum Steele, has done. I think Callum is a slightly different position to myself in relation to the ability that I have to sit down with the service and collectively bargain. But I think what it recognises, that perception recognises the fact that we have done an awful lot of work behind closed doors and in private. We have sat down with the service and resolved an awful lot of problems and an awful lot of issues that have come up that have never reached the public domain. Uh, I think it recognises that we have we've worked incredibly hard behind the scenes. We, we do have a working together framework which by and large works. However, I, I think at some point, uh, you know, and I, 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 do, I do welcome, you know, the Chief's uh, assurances and reassurances about, you know, the resolving some of the issues, especially around about harmonisation of terms and conditions. But unfortunately, I've heard them before. And, you know, and, and it is time for those words to, to be delivered in actions. Um, if our members have had, made, you know, have made such a significant contribution to the success of the new service, and I believe they have, uh, we make a simple demand that that recognition and dedication and hard work is recognised with reward, you know, and not just a continual pat on the back. The, 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 the chief himself uh, referenced the, you know, the benefits of reform. The, the minister referenced those benefits of reform a few days ago in an international symposium, and, and one of those benefits was, for example, uh, access to equitable access to specialist resources. That is a consequence of some of the issues and the problems that we've had inside the service, not being able to harmonise those terms and conditions. And there are many other issues and problems with inside the, uh, inside the service just now that we are trying to resolve. I think the problem that we have and the, the message that's coming across loud and clear to myself and our officials is that the service are no longer listening. They may be listening, but they're not acting. They're not acting on the concerns and they're not acting on the, the, the issues that have been brought to us day in, day out. And, from the Fire Brigade Union point of view, I am finding it increasingly frustrating sitting week after week, month after month with the service, resolving problems that are of not, not of our making and sitting there quietly and privately behind closed doors and not getting a great deal of credit for it, to be honest. So I think we now need to, as I said earlier on, we are entering a new phase of the, 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 the reform of the service, uh, but these difficulties now have to be faced and have to be we, we must be honest that there are problems in the background. There are issues, there are lots of underlying issues and difficulties within the organisation. 
We have, I think, gone about it thus far in the right way. And it's only very, very recently that I think I've come out quite publicly and started to be a bit more openly crit critical of the organisation, the way they've been handled. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would concur. There's a, a very good um, public um, response to the, the amalgamation, and there's clearly a lot of hard work going on. I want to pick up on, on, on the issue that uh, uh, Mr McClone touched on latterly there, and that was the equitable access to specialist service. Um, my understanding is, as regards to FBU, there is national bargaining, but there was also local arrangements as well. And, I, you know, I suppose it's the, well, I'll own the statement. I, I, I'm disappointed that we are this far in and there hasn't been harmonisation. But I'm interested to know how that might manifest itself. I mean, for instance, the, what's referred to as water and line rescue, I understand that attracted something that, you, again, you alluded to in your first response, Mr McLone, additional responsibility allowance. Does that, does that mean, and this is maybe for Mr McClone and Mr Hay, that that particular specialism isn't being rolled out because that is still one of the issues that's to be resolved? Yeah, I, I'm quite happy to answer that. It, the, there were additional responsibility allowances were paid to recognise uh, area of, areas of the role that, that, that sat out with the, the role map of a firefighter. And by and large, there were areas within the organisation that, that perhaps didn't, you know, uh, you know, weren't uh, obligations, you know, within statutory duties. Uh, specialist line rescue, water rescue were just two examples. Now, we did inherit, and the service inherited a, a broad range and disparity of payments across the organisations in relation to those uh, additional responsibility allowances. However, we feel it's, we feel it's, uh, it's only fair that four or five years into the new service that those are addressed. I think we've been very reasonable in the, the demands or the requests that we've made for payment for those services, especially in the areas that we're still having, having issues, because uh, you seem to be okay if you're across the central belt. If you're in Dumfries, Dumfries and Galloway or the, the, the northeast, we have uh, specialist teams there who have been trained, who have not been deployed because the service are not prepared to pay them uh, the, the, the same salary, the same amount of payment for conducting those roles. So we, we think that is unacceptable four years, four years down the line. I wonder, Mr Hay, is that the case? Is it the case that there isn't equitable access to these specialist services? That would be extremely disappointing if it were the case. I think that what we have done is we have um, created far more equitable access to specialist resources. In relation to water, as an example, we had 14 teams at the outset, and we've now got 20 teams uh, across Scotland. Um, and I think that the way that Chris is portraying this uh, has a little bit more nuance to it uh, that, than he is e explaining today. Um, we do have a collective agreement that stands with the Fire Brigade Union at this moment in time in relation to additional responsibilities, uh, allowances. Uh, and what that was is that until the point of harmonisation, until the point of harmonisation, uh, we would pay any new team that, that came online uh, the rate that they were getting within their antecedent service. Uh, and the two places that he's talking about specifically there, we have an issue in Aberdeen and we have a, an issue down in, in, in Dumfries. And to be fair to the staff, in good faith, they've undertaken all the training and are now at the point where they're ready to be deployed. Uh, but they didn't previously have uh, an additional responsibility allowance. Uh, this has been raised. Uh, we've offered, uh, you know, as a gesture just now, until we do the full harmonisation, £250 uh, additional uh, allowance, recognising that they are taking on uh, new work. Uh, that, at the moment, has not been accepted, uh, you know, but it is a live negotiation. So we would hope to resolve that um, as quickly as we possibly can now. Um, so that, that, that I think we have, um, against all the specialisms, we have far more teams rolled out across the country than we had at the start. Uh, we don't deny the fact that, that harmonisation has not been completed. It is a priority for the organisation uh, and we have had collective agreements that we've been able to build on and the negotiation to finalise those is not finished yet. Okay. Well, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not seeking to turn this forum into a negotiating. Absolutely. It is more around the practical manifestation of that. Is it the case, then, that there are any areas where this particular, either of these facilities, the water and line rescue, are not available to? Well, the, 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 there's two specifics. We've got 
shortly a line rescue team that we hope to bring on line, sorry for the expression, uh, in, in Aberdeen and also specialist water rescue within uh, Dumfries. Uh, but at this moment in time, because of the issue in relation to uh, the harmonisation, we've been advised by uh, Chris and his team that they do not accept the offer that's been made. You know, our understanding was we did have an agreement because we will do this until we harmonise. It's a goodwill gesture. We've offered £250, but we know that will not be the end. So, with the exception of those, to my understanding, every other uh, additional asset that we have uh, brought into the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is deployed and is operational. Well, you mentioned community safety, and that's of paramount concern, so I'm sure you'll redouble your efforts to reach a resolution on Because this is very important, you know. That Absolutely. And, 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 of course, because we have far more specialist assets than we had under the antecedent services and there are no boundaries, uh, you know, we are able to deploy these assets pan-Scotland, you know, very easily and very readily. And that has happened on numerous occasions. So in terms of the benefits to the people of Scotland, uh, you know, we can strongly evidence that that has already occurred. Douglas Ross. Mr. He, you had uh, some interesting facial expressions in reaction to Mr. McGlone's uh, comments about the harmonisation. Does that mean you, you disagree with his perception about there being a lot of talk but little action? Um, well, I'm surprised that I had some... Uh, strange facial expressions. It was very overt, and uh, it was only time you, during this you, you, uh, conversation I'll, so far. I'll, I'll watch that back uh, on camera. It's uh, worth it. And try and get a poker face. Mm. Um, the, the, I, I don't recognise uh, the, the comment that um, the service is not listening. I, I genuinely don't recognise that comment. Um, we have a partnership advisory group, as I uh, explained earlier, where if there are any issues... Uh, where the teams that are doing all the negotiations uh, are finding that they have met a, a stumbling block and they cannot resolve it, it can be escalated up to this partnership advisory group where Chris uh, and you know, some of his committee members can come along and speak directly to the chair, the vice chair and myself and we can try and find ways around those stumbling blocks. Uh, in relation to the, the, this harmonisation, which seems to be the big, the big issue, um, if we go back to the minutes uh, in September of last year, uh, it's very clear on the minutes that I was seeking uh, to resolve this as quickly as possible. Chris acknowledged all the hard work that had actually uh, been done up until that point. Uh, and uh, we then were supposed to be having a follow-up meeting in December and then another subsequent follow-up meeting. Uh, but on all occasions, uh, it's been cancelled by the Fire Brigade Union. They said they have no business to bring to the table. So when you say we're not listening, when you have these forums to resolve issues, uh, it gets brought, we try and suggest a way forward, and then the follow-up meetings are cancelled because there's no business to bring. That's why it sounds slightly surprising to me that we're not listening. If you provide forums you know, to bring these things to, to my attention, to the Chair's attention, uh, and they are not used, you can only make the assumption and the feedback we are getting is that good, steady progress is being made. But as I've already said, you know, I've heard loud and clear uh, that this is an issue and absolutely committed to resolve it in the quickest possible time. Yeah, I would, uh, I would completely disagree with what the Chief Officer said there, obviously, and uh, I think it's somewhat disingenuous to suggest that we have no business to take to the, you know, the Partnership Advisory Group meeting. I think the, the conclusion was that the, the current path we were on was not going to result in a, a resolution or a conclusion to uh, the harmonisation of terms and conditions, and therefore the, it, it, would, it would perhaps be sensible to seek another avenue to resolve that. Uh, we've had various formal discussions with the service, and certainly I have with uh, uh, one of the Assistant Chief Officers within the service with regard to for want of a better term, rolling up har the, the harmonisation terms and conditions issue into service transformation and redesign. So I think it's disingenuous for the Chief to sit there and say that we have failed to bring this issue to the Partnership Advisory Group. We have previously, uh, we've, we've essentially, I think, agreed uh, on both sides of the table that it has failed uh, 
uh, and it will not be resolved within the current forum and therefore we have to seek another solution in a, another forum and clearly it's still a, a massive issue for ourselves and, if, and believe me if there was a forum sitting there just now where we could resolve this because it's certainly the biggest issue for the Fire Brigade Union and it's giving us the, the, you know, the biggest headache amongst members, believe me I would take it to that forum. Maybe Mr Waters can, can answer, um, but Mr He, you mentioned that it was the intention of the service to have harmonisation completed by the start of this financial year. You've not been able to achieve that. What is your target date now? Well, we, we, we don't have an actual target date. What we want to do is come round the table, and as Chris has alluded to there, uh, if we cannot, ha if we cannot harmonise it here within Scotland, uh, there are dispute resolution processes within our National Joint Council uh, and there are timescales attached to that. So we are more than happy to come round the table as quickly as possible to see if we can uh, resolve it finally <coughs> here within Scotland. And if not, we know that there are uh, established routes to resolve these issues that, that we, may, we may have to go down. Do you know you're here today because it's part of the, the duty of this committee to monitor and evaluate the operation of the single fire and rescue service. Therefore, how can we do that if we don't know what kind of timescale? You previously had a timescale. What should we now be looking at as committee members of this parliamentary committee as a success or otherwise to this harmonisation project moving forward? I think Mr Waters wanted to come in earlier. I think it's extremely difficult to, do, to actually put a, t a time scale on it. We're talking about negotiation, a complete, an extremely complicated negotiation on how we take the... Had a time scale? We had a time scale, and hopefully to get to a conclusion. Um, that's, that's not been met. And can I say that, I mean, I am a bit disappointed to, to hear that the mechanism that we've set up in the partnership advisory group, which we both sit on, both as employers and employees' representatives, I not only chair the board, but I also chair that committee. And it's the first time I've heard that that committee is no longer functioning and not equipped to actually solve some of the problems set up to do. That's the reason it's there. The reason it's there is to solve some of the problems, not to solve the problems, but to actually oil the mechanism to allow the problems to be solved into the future. Is there a, is there a time scale? The time scale is for us to get this done as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and I think Chris is absolutely right. The Chief Officer also mentioned that there is two areas that are coming together at the same time. One is the, the harmonisation of condition of service, and two is the transformation of the service and how we move forward to protect the communities of Scotland into the future. That is not an easy solution and not something we can say we will solve that by X, X day, but it's an ongoing discussion with our representative bodies and how we move that forward. Sorry, I, I just don't understand that because you had previously said it would be done by X day. The X day was the start of this financial year. You've been unable to do that. Therefore, how was it possible to set a date for the start of this financial year, but now it's impossible to say to this parliamentary committee who are trying to scrutinise your work when we should expect to see further action? I think that's a fairly reasonable request. I think, um, and perhaps um, I wasn't clear enough, we that was a target, the 31st of March, uh, because we wanted, we wanted to resolve these outstanding issues as quick as was practically uh, possible. Um, it was an aspiration. It's clear that we didn't meet that. Uh, and we're not trying to be elusive here. What we're trying to say is we want to get round the table as quickly as we possibly can, uh, have a progressive discussion uh, and resolve this. Uh, I think you were in danger of turning this into a, a negotiation between myself uh, and Chris, which, you know, as, as Mr Finney pointed out, that's, that, that's not, you know, the purpose of here today. But once we've had that, we, we will have more clarity on the timescales that we are seeking to work to. If we cannot resolve it uh, here within Scotland, there are timescales by which joint secretaries uh, and resolution advisory panels uh, can take place within the, the, the NGAC. So let's have a conversation uh, see if we can resolve it in Scotland. If not, then we'll know what the backstop dates are through these uh, external resolution processes, and I'm sure we can then feed that back to the committee and yourself uh, to give you some degree of assurance. Well, well, that would be useful to get that feedback. Could I come uh, to another issue now? All the panel have spoken about the importance of staff. Mr Waters was saying a partnership and cooperation with staff was a priority. Why then have the Single Fire and Rescue Service continued to fail to release the 2015 staff survey results? 
Why, why can't we know what the staff were saying? Um, I, well, we didn't do a staff survey. We did a cultural audit uh, of the organisation. Which, which uh, you haven't been willing uh, to reveal publicly the outcomes of that. Well, we, we, we have revealed as much as we can reveal publicly. But I think the bits that people uh, have been pursuing us on, uh, 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 we spoke to staff, we had focus groups, and they were given an absolute promise that anything they said uh, would be um, treated in the absolute confidence. Uh, and we have to respect uh, the offer that was made to staff uh, in relation to um, what they would say in the context in which they said it. And, and this has Without been, and, and this has any been confidentiality. And this has been, you know, the, the questions that have been asked of us uh, in relation to that, they've been taken, you know, my, my, you know to my understanding, uh, through the Freedom of Information Commissioner, etc., uh, and they've upheld uh, the stance of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in relation to these things. We're not trying to be uh, in any way, shape or form uh, elusive. Uh, we're not trying to be uh, lack transparency. Uh, what we're trying to do here in relation to a cultural audit is we set the, the frame of reference for it. We gave staff very explicit uh, guarantees around <laughs> how, how it would be used and what the confidentiality is, uh, and we've tried to respect that. Do you agree you've been less transparent than the police service? No. no. Well, they, they've been willing to reveal all their uh, surveys that they do, even when it's bad information. It's not bad information. It's a matter of a commitment on confidentiality that we already committed to staff. And but, that's been examined. But so you would have been able to tell them we you know, it's not going to be Douglas Ross said X, but a number of respondents had concerns over X, Y and Z. Surely you could do that without breaching confidentiality? Because I think the public would want to know where areas of concern have been raised by staff. But I, I go back, it wasn't a staff satisfaction survey, it was a cultural audit. We but were they were able in. to give their so opinions it, on what they yeah, were happy I'm, and unhappy I'm, with. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but what we're talking about here is a, is a tool by which we can try and address some of the cultural uh, differences that, that, that Chris explained earlier. Uh, and it's working with staff to actually do that. It wasn't, you know, the intention is not to be lack transparency, it's to actually work with staff to find out the areas that we collectively need to work on to create a single cohesive, positive culture for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Given us a clear answer, we need to move on. Other members sorry, are... I'd, I'd like sorry, to Mr. Mr. McGlone. Sorry. Yeah, just, just very briefly, we share your same concerns. I did request the responses from the, the cultural audit two years ago uh, and got the same answer as yourself, uh, I believe, because I think the... the I think the critical importance of the responses was that they were used to feed into the, the cultural plan. I'm not convinced there's a, 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 a any great degree of uh, confidence in the cultural plan because nobody knows what the responses were or the employees don't know what the responses were. Uh, however, in res response to ourselves, it is the intention of the FBU to survey our near 5,000 members in the near future on their own views you know, of the service and we will release and fill those results to the public. Thank you, Chair. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. Just before I move to my bit, can I say, don't set arbitrary dates. Just deal with the issues that are in the entry on the appropriate dates that both parties deal with it. I'm in a different place from uh, Douglas Ross on that. So he doesn't speak, necessarily speak for the committee. I wanted to just briefly uh, turn to another matter that hasn't arisen so far. Uh, and it goes right back to where we started, that the staff are the important part of the service. We haven't heard anything so far about how the retained staff uh, contribute to the future development. And for someone like myself, and there will be others here as well, who represent areas uh, which are quite rural, the retained staff are often the face of the fire service. And, uh, and of course, I think they will not be being represented directly by the trade unions, although some of them might be indirectly. And I just wondered how the retained staff feed into the future development of the, uh, of the, of the fire service and indeed uh, uh, what their future is in the service. Can I have a off and then, then ask the, the chief officer to come in with, with, with some of the information? Um, I think to say something about retained staff, can I, can I take you back to Storm Frank? when it hit Scotland over Christmas and New Year. 
and I'll take you to the northeast of Scotland and have a look at how that retained staff unit and the units round about them re responded to that. It wasn't just during that terrible period for those, those communities that they responded, but continued to respond well into the, 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 the weeks and months following. And can I say that some of the staff that were dealing with that were in the exact same circumstances that the people they were trying to assist. Their homes had been flooded, their families were out, but they were still providing the service to their community. Nothing says more about the commitment of our retained staff than that kind of response. They are tremendous and we could not run the service in Scotland without the commitment of, that, of, the, of, the, of the staff. It was absolutely outstanding and continues to be outstanding at any time they are needed, they are there. But I'll hand you over to the Chief Officer to give some of the... The, yes. the Chief, can I absolutely associate myself? My constituency, as luck would have it, was comparatively unaffected in the North East compared to neighbouring ones. But the, the value that uh, people in the North East got from the retained staff on that occasion, as many others, was exactly as you described, Mr Walters. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you can only echo the, 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 the admiration that everybody's expressed for the work that uh, our retained colleagues do. I think when Stephen Torrey was the chief inspector, uh, he came to this committee and he suggested that there, that there were, um, I think the words he used is, is, is that the retained service was almost broken, uh, not just here within Scotland, but across uh, you know, the whole of the UK and perhaps um, across the Western world because the, the, the way that people lead their lives uh, has changed entirely from the way that the uh, retained service was, was designed and set up in the 1950s. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it was broken, but it's certainly uh, facing severe pressures, um, really severe pressures. So you know, what, what have we done about that? And you know, your, your question specifically was about how have they fed into this? Uh, and it absolutely is about um, listening to them. One of our recently retired assistant chief officers, he led, led a major piece of work that looked into how um, we could make the best of the current terms and conditions of service uh, and the current um, retained duty system here within Scotland. And he also looked at options uh, in relation to service redesign. Um, we're still working very actively in relation to uh, uh, service redesign. Uh, and we actually believe that service redesign, um, you cannot just look at the retained service and you cannot look at the whole time service. It's looking at the totality of the resource that's available across Scotland uh, and how that can then be deployed to best effect for maximum benefit to all the people of Scotland. So that was one of the major um, things that came out of the piece of work. But in relation to making the best of where we are at this moment in time, uh, we, we, as part of the work, we set up a, um, we invited retained members to become involved in it, uh, and we also set up a sounding board so we could try and understand what were the real barriers that they were actually facing. Uh, and a couple of examples of that would be that they had to travel too long uh, to access training facilities. So to go away from their home or their business for three days uh, was just impractical uh, for, for them. Uh, so we have very much focused on investing uh, in our training infrastructure with a great support from Scottish Government uh, and providing us with the money to provide training facilities uh, within the Orkney Islands, within Shetlands uh, and also within the Western Isles so that staff can actually access these things locally because we heard that from them. Uh, you know, they're really concerned uh, ab about... Um, the time it was taken from showing interest to them actually being told whether they had a job or not. So we've streamlined all the processes. Uh, our intention is to try and do it within three months. Uh, we, we heard some horror stories that it was taken well over a year. So we've listened to them and we've done all that. Uh, and we, we um, have made some considerable progress uh, in this area. Uh, by the time we get to the end of May, uh, we will have 3,021 uh, sorry, retained um, firefighters in Scotland, uh, which takes us back up to uh, parity with where we were. 
when the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service started, and it's the first time uh, in, in nearly uh, 20 years we've seen a reversal of the reduction. So that has been a huge piece of work, and credit to everybody that's been involved in that. If I can indicate to you that this year alone, uh, we have um, recruited 119 RDS firefighters this calendar year, with another 93 uh, coming in uh, in May, and we've got over 370 that are now in the process. So we've done that, uh, 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 and we've done that by listening to what the concerns are and getting support, you know, from colleagues within the service. But you know, I emphasise some really good financial support from Scottish government to improve uh, the training facilities for the RDS. But I, I do not underestimate, you know, the, the challenges that lie ahead, and I think it will have to be addressed through fundamental structural redesign of the service. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I totally agree with Pat, what the Chief has said in relation to you know, our RDS colleagues. They, they do an absolutely fantastic job under difficult circumstances and within their communities. Um, I have to disagree again with the Chief in relation to, you know, he's listening to those employees and the Chief did mention some barriers that they are facing. Well, one of the barriers that we are facing at the moment is, uh, is getting the service to listen to our concerns over the nationally agreed rates of pay. Uh, in relation to holiday pay, disturbance payments, sick pay, and at least three of the antecedent services, serious breaches of the less favourable treatment of part-time workers' legislation. Now, we've raised this time and time again with the service, and, and again, it's falling in deaf ears. So I, I just can't agree with the Chief when he says that we are listening to our employees and we are acting on what those employees are saying, because our experience is different. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Good evening, gentlemen. Any organisation that has such a transformational change and harmonisation is going to have difficulties. And I think you've explained that this morning, who you are. But for me, you know, we've, you've talked about success, how successful you seem to have been uh, as you've gone forward. But there's obviously cracks beginning to show in this whole process. Uh, for me, the, the crux of the word is staff morale. What kind of staff morale do we have? Uh, there's been some questioning about... Uh, surveys and audits that's been done about how things are progressing. Uh, but there obviously seems to be some difficulty there. Uh, uh, and we have seen the morale in the police service, uh, we're told, at an all-time low uh, because of what they've had to suffer uh, in going through this process. Uh, and as I say, and you've been held up as a beacon of success in comparison. Uh, but can I ask, in reality, where are we with the staff morale situation now? Because as you go forward, we've had four years of success, uh, but it's obviously going to get much more difficult uh, as you progress. Uh, and as I say, from the reactions I've had and seen this morning, uh, as I say, I think there, is, there are cracks within the system uh, that are beginning to surface. Uh, and that will have a knock-on effect for service cover, I would suggest, across the country. I can't speak for the, the Chief's perception or the Service's perception, but from the FBU's perception, that's rock bottom at the moment. Uh, those same employees, you know, that are being, you know, trumpeted and, uh, and obviously praised have gradually become despondent as a single service continues to be trumpeted as a success. They become increasingly detached from the success story, feel undervalued, feel underpaid in many areas of the organisation, overworked and under stress. That is the, the reality of the, the situation and the, the experience of the Fire Brigade Union today. Also, uh, echo some of the thoughts uh, for the FBU. Uh, basically, the, the job evaluation process for support staff was, if you want the Holy Grail, it was going to fix everything. It was going to be uh, basically fix everything so uh, everybody could be on a, a harmonised pay. Uh, we, through that process, it's been a lengthy process. We've actually lost quite a few key staff members with serious amounts of service under our belts. And basically, we've had the commitment, we've heard the commitment for the Chief today saying that there's, there's policies and processes in place regards getting these staff out of uh, detriment as, as if and when they can. There's various examples, uh, even like say, within the current process, the advertising jobs, they, they seem to be going external before they're going internal, where this would uh, relieve some of the people in detriment. We're talking a, a number of our members <coughs> are predominantly women members who are in the low paid grades and that's like grade one, grade two. And some of these jobs are, are at 
it's no professional jobs, meaning it's, we've got people within the departments, within the directorates, uh, maybe through some form of retraining or, or things like that. Basically, they could achieve that, that goal of getting out of the detriment. Our staff as well, uh, again, are, are pretty much, the morale's pretty low. Uh, they've been waiting. We've went through appeals process as well. Uh, uh, the job of our Eastern appeals process, people are still waiting uh, on outcomes. For, we've had the outcomes for that, but uh, we're, there's still something in the background going on about that. People are still hanging their coats firmly on job evaluation and the pay and reward fixing everything, and it, it just hasn't for us support staff. If, if, yes, if I come in there, um, yes. you know, um, this has been a success uh, and it's not hollow words when I say this has been down to uh, the commitment, the dedication of staff at all levels within the organisation. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Has it been, um, you know, easy for people? Clearly it hasn't been, you know, and, and we can't deny the fact that, that any major change process uh, is going to be difficult for people. I think I said that at the beginning, uh, and it is a credit to them. Uh, are there cracks, uh, as Mr Stewart says, um, beginning to appear? Well, it sounds very much like that. Uh, and, and, and what I can say is, is that what we need to do perhaps then is get back round uh, the table, reflect on what has made this successful to date, identify exactly what the priorities are uh, to do the consolidation, in relation to the journey we've been on so far, but also lift our heads to look at what transformation will mean for all staff. Uh, now, what I can say is that we are in the process of preparing uh, a staff satisfaction uh, survey uh, within the organisation, so we will be doing that as well. Um, and just some of the indicators, though, of, of, you know, Derek spoke about staff turnover. I've already said 2.5% is our staff turnover rate, which is you know, well below the average uh, here within Scotland in the public sector. Um, and in terms of uh, attendance, you know, sickness levels, they're actually significantly lower than they were prior to uh, reform of the service. So you know, th these are indirect indicators, and we will do a staff satisfaction survey. Uh, but absolutely, what I've heard loud and clear is there are, that there are conversations that have to be underscored by action, uh, not to let the great work that's happened, uh, you know, disappear. Uh, and, I, and I could understand that that could happen quickly. Yeah, can I, just to add to, to that, I mean, there has been a major change within the whole organisation. Um, does that cause unrest and, and sometimes anxiety? Yes, it does. Um, can I indicate that... that Absolutely right that um, what Derek quoted was the 27% of people who found themselves in debt for at the end of the job evaluation exercise. Can I, can I reflect the other side of that? That meant 73% didn't. 73% were as good or better as a result of that job evaluation exercise. Does that minimise the impact on that 27%? No, it doesn't. And we need to continue to work to ensure that we try to move that forward. But it can't change. It was the, that was the outcome of the job evaluation exercise. Just one other figure that I'd like to, to indicate to the committee. Recently, when we advertised for new members of whole-time staff, firefighter staff, we crashed the local government website, which we use for recruitment, on three occasions. We had over 5,000 people applying for the jobs that were there. We are an organisation that people want to work for. We are in a major change at the present time, and are there issues? Yes, there are. Will we deal with them? Yes, we will. And will we do it in conjunction with our trade union colleagues? Yes, we will. That's what our partnership agreement says. That's what we've agreed to do, and that's what we're committed to do. Yes, we've got anxiety, sometimes there's frustration. There'll be frustrations in the trade union side. And let me assure you there'll be frustrations on my side as well. But we will work it out together. The reason we're in the position we are in today is because we have managed so far to continue to work things out together. That is the way for the future. This cannot be done to the service. It has to be done with the service. Thank you. Um, do you want to come back in, Alexander? 
there's always been a mass amount of goodwill so far in, in this whole process, uh, and I think that is to all your credit. Uh, but that goodwill will disappear, uh, and your percentages may rise if you do not tackle this in the, the short to medium term. Uh, and I think you've identified that today, so I would wish you well in that process. Uh, but as I say, you know, it's not an easy one to, to, to manage. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Mary Evans. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, I would just like to ask you a question, and it's about the, the closure of uh, some of the control rooms, because I think there was a lot of concern and worry at the time that that was first, when that was first suggest, suggested, uh, that it would lead to that there would be a lack of knowledge of geographical knowledge in some of the, the areas. And I would just like to ask about your thoughts on what the experience of that has been so far. Has that proven to be the case, or has that local knowledge been able to be maintained uh, through the, the control room closures? We have um, predicated um, the change in the control rooms on a proven model. Uh, we, we know that the Johnston control room, which covered the old Strathclyde area, um, covered 12 local authority areas, uh, handled over 50% of emergency calls in Scotland, uh, which was pre they were previously uh, handled by five control rooms prior to the creation of the Strathclyde Fire and Rescue Service. So we've predicated uh, the moves that we have made to create three control rooms in Scotland uh, on a proven successful model. Uh, um, local knowledge plays a part, but what I say is it's about professional knowledge. Uh, you know, I grew up in this city here in Edinburgh uh, on the south side. The north side of the city is a complete mystery to me. You know, just because you grow up somewhere doesn't mean to say you've got the professional detail type of knowledge that is required. Uh, and that is developed by staff when they join a control room uh, and they go through the relevant um, training programmes. That is also underpinned uh, by um, the technology. Uh, gazetteers is, is, is one of the things, which is basically mapping systems. Uh, and we look at what the risks are. We look at the type of resource that we would deploy. Uh, we match that to all the mapping type information. And we ally that to the uh, professional knowledge uh, of the control room staff. Um, there, there have been a couple of glitches uh, when we first came over. But our layers, our layers of... Uh, resilience very quickly have picked those up. I don't want to say um, you know, too much more because uh, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue Services uh, has done uh, and has been uh, a, 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 a review and he has produced a, a, a report. Uh, what I can say, uh, and I've spoken to him throughout the entire process, is that he has not picked up uh, any uh, major concerns. Uh, and any recommendations that are likely to go public. Um, he has advised us of those throughout the process, so we've already taken action on those. But it will be for the Chief Inspector to lay this report before Parliament, and I'm sure at a future day we will have the opportunity uh, to speak to it, and it will be scrutinised by this committee. So, on the back of that, then, would you say that the three control rooms that there are now, are they have the the right levels of staff there with the right knowledge and they are all fully up to speed um, to provide that safe service? I think we're providing a safe service. Um, I think we're still in the transition uh, period for this. Uh, um, we agreed with the Fire Brigade Union uh, what a safe uh, model would be. Uh, we have had some challenges in relation to uh, the North Control staffing that up to the levels. Uh, we have offered um, you know, over time, uh, you know, we've taken staff out of other posts to try and keep it up, but there have been occasions when we've not had our agreed, mo our agreed staffing within that, uh, though it has never compromised public safety. Uh, but what we have at this moment in time is we've got 10 trainees uh, who are currently undergoing the training. Uh, five of them will go into that north control, five of them will go into other controls to try and keep them up. But what we've also now put in place uh, as a long-term succession plan for the control rooms uh, to make sure that we, you know, we've, we've anticipated the vacancies over the next 10 years. We've anticipated our capacity to recruit, support them through their training process. Uh, and this is now all uh, in train within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, but there is work, you know, that, that has to be properly and robustly implemented. Okay, thank you.
I don't, would you like to? Can I, sorry, can I just say at this stage, we've got a few more questions to ask. We're rapidly running out of time, so if you can keep the questions, members keep the questions very brief and the answers very brief, please. Um, I, I didn't have another question, but I think Mr. McGowan was just, to Just come very, very uh, yeah. Yeah. briefly, you know, I, I would welcome the Chief's uh, you know, honesty there in, in relation to some of the difficulties that the, the control and control staff uh, have experienced throughout this process. I think it's been an incredibly difficult process and, uh, and not without pain and disturbance and uh, all the other things that go with the closure of a, a, a workplace. Uh, we, we, we did in our initial consultation to the, you know, the single service uh, seek assurances that improved local control and mobilisation services would maintain local knowledge uh, in line with existing structures. And uh, that local knowledge uh, and the importance of that local knowledge was reiterated in a, a recent uh, report that was published by the, the Fire Brigade Union uh, it was reiterated by Linda Rowan and Neil, who's the, the National Control uh, Committee Secretary. Uh, just very briefly, if I can read that out. She, she, she states that many people do not know the, the location they are when they, they, they phone uh, in for an emergency. We take for granted that perhaps somebody's sitting in a house or they, they know exactly where they are. They could be driving along, along the road. They could be in a, you know, an unfamiliar area, especially when you go into the more remote rural areas of Scotland. Um, so Linda says, so much of the job is based on local knowledge. I know where the road, the, that, that the pub you passed a few minutes ago is on, even if you don't. I know which motorway junction is nearest, based on a snippet of information you caught out of the corner of your eye and the last sign you passed. I know where the old factory is, despite the fact that it was closed down several years ago. I couldn't do my job nearly as well if I were unfamiliar with the area. So local knowledge, I think, is critically important. I think modern uh, 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 systems uh, are obviously critically important to the efficient functioning of the controls, but there has to be resilience as well, and we have to have some kind of fallback uh, when the sat-nav doesn't work. Thank okay, you, Thank Chair. you. We've got five minutes for three questions, so they need to be very brief. Mary? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the reduction in whole-time operational staff, because between 2015 and 16, 166 whole-time operational staff left the service, and there were reductions in, in, in other areas um, and, is, as well. And I just wondered if you could explain the rationale behind that. Was it solely down to the integration of the, the different um, areas? Um, did people leave because of dissatisfaction? Um, could you give us a bit more information about that? Mr Hay, perhaps, and then Mr McGloan. Yeah, um, the vast majority of people that are leaving uh, are leaving because they're reaching their pensionable point within the service. Um, we, 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 it varies depending on recruitment patterns that happened 30 years ago, because still at the moment firefighters normally retire after 30 years service. Um, but, you know, we between 100 and 50 and 200 is, is the normal retiral pattern within the service. Uh, we are losing uh, about two people per month, uh, firefighters, uh, who are not retiring. Uh, that's that's the, the, the information that I actually have. So it's down to normal retirement, uh, the vast majority of people that are leaving the service. Okay. And is the staffing level at the correct, the correct level now? across whole-time whole operational staff? Yeah, we, well, we, we have agreed with the Fire Brigade Union what we call resource-based crewing, uh, which is uh, the right number of staff that we consider unnecessary to be on fire stations to create uh, a safe system of work. Uh, and one of the things I think we're collectively proud of is that, that we, we ride uh, five on the first appliance and four on the second appliance at whole-time fire stations in Scotland. Uh, and we are the only service in the mainland UK that has that as a minimum. The only other service that does it is Northern Ireland. So you know, we've worked hard on that. We have a resource-based crewing uh, establishment. Uh, that resource-based um, crewing is actually 3,071. That's what we've agreed with the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, when I got the figures checked, we've got uh, 3,035. So we have got, you know, a small number, uh, a, a small gap in there, um, but there is a buffer built in uh, to, to the service to, to allow that. Uh, and what I can tell you is that we have got 111 people that are currently on a holding list, uh, uh, and we have got the intention of running three uh, whole-time recruit courses this year. Um, and those three courses, you know, will, will keep us as close as we possibly can to the agreed uh, establishment level through resource-based crew. 
Thank you. I'm going to need to move on to the next next question. Uh, Liam. Thank you, Mr. McGlone, for his comments in relation to the to, to the local knowledge around control rooms. But obviously, we'll wait to see what the inspector's report says. Just turning back to the the issue of retained stations. I mean, I acknowledge Mr. Hayes' um, comments about the investment in training facilities, um, the, the speeding up of the of the uh, recruitment process itself. But what specific work's been going on with other blue light services um, in, in the islands I represent, for example, part of the problem appears to be that you're dividing a very small population across um, a reasonably wide range of, of different services, uh, and they don't necessarily all appear to join up in terms of the requirements they place upon those that are uh, retained or they volunteer. So is the work actively going on to, to establish where there's a, a demand for it, a more joined up blue light service uh, across fire and rescue, ambulance and, and, and other services? Um, there is work going on, uh, particularly at local level. Conversations are always happening between the uh, local senior officers within these communities, uh, directly with the communities to understand um, how each, each of us uh, can be supported by the communities uh, at the times when an emergency service is actually required. Um, it's my understanding that you cannot hold the office of constable and as a retained firefighter. That's in the legislation. So there, there are issues around that. Uh, but perhaps um, I think something that might be of, of, of interest to you is we've agreed, uh, and there's, there's budget for it this year, uh, to put a whole time post into each of the three main uh, island groupings within Scotland, and, and the purpose of that is for them to work very closely with the local communities. They'll also be able to respond to incidents, but they're going to set up uh, a young firefighter scheme within those island communities. So we get in with the young people uh, so that you know, they're the most likely to stay and, re and, and return uh, to, to some of the more remote parts, and they understand what the fire service is all about. So what we're trying to do there is make sure people understand the value of the service to their communities, how they can be, how they can be a part of it, uh, as well as giving them uh, transformational skills. So we're also looking to resolve these things, not just with the, the local community uh, you know, and their young people, uh, but also with our um, colleagues in the other services. So that's just an indication of the type of work that's going on to understand the needs and how we can best meet them. Ben, as brief as you can, please. Convener, it was stated earlier that there's been uh, 55, over 55 million uh, of cost savings uh, since integration occurred. But the committee is also aware that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, like Police Scotland, carries a VAT liability of approximately 10 million per annum, so uh, approximately 40 million uh, since uh, the financial year 2013-14. From the, the, the correspondence that you've had, have there, has there been any movement from the UK government on this, on this matter? And in your view, in terms of enhancing the service, how would that money have been spent if the, the liability was removed? How would it be spent going forward? This in, the, in the first instance, I mean, I mean, what have we done with it? We have the stock answer for the UK government on every occasion. I have personally written to the, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Every MP uh, representing Scotland in Parliament with we, we copies to to uh, representatives within within this building. Um, what what the the Treasury has said is you knew this was going to happen, and so therefore you should have been taken care of it. It's full stop. Uh, we don't meet the legislation, which is absolutely right. We don't. But neither did the the legacy service for the London Olympics that went for to cover the whole of the UK and it was only a London based organisation. And there was an exemption made for them. Equally Transport for England was a local organisation and went UK wide went England wide. And there was an exemption made for them. And that's when we raised that matter. Could we use that ten million pound? You better believe we could. We could maybe deal with some of the issues that we're facing at the present time and some of the issues we're going to face into the future. I think the other interesting point is when the people of Scotland have to provide for major emergencies, it costs them 20% more than anywhere else in the UK to provide that. Is that right? It may be meet the legislation. It might be there in the legislation. But is it right? You better believe it's not. It's not that the people of Scotland, to get the same protection for elsewhere, has cost them 20% more. It cannot be right, even though it meets legislation or meets the legal requirement. It is not right. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. I think I, I, several I, others on the committee agree. Word, yeah. I, 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 I would just, you know, echo that we've <coughs> had, you know, a standard letter back from from UK government, uh, and we've we've taken it up in Scottish government, and we really appreciate the support that they've given us in trying to pursue this. Thank you very much. I'm afraid now we are out of time. So can I thank the panel very much for coming. I think it's been a very useful and informative session. Thank you very much. I'll suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave and the uh, public gallery to leave. Oh. Sorry, the public gallery can stay. <laughs> if you will. We, we move to item, agenda item two, which is a limitation childhood abuse Scotland bill. Um, agenda item two, um, I would ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and to the marshalled list of amendments for this item. Can I welcome the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials. Apologise for this short delay in, in keeping you there. Um, can I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own and the Minister to move and speak to the amendment? 
Hi, good morning, uh, uh, Convener. Um, this uh, amendment ensures that there is no doubt that abuse in the form of neglect is covered by the definition of abuse in the bill. While the existing definition would not exclude other forms of abuse such as neglect, this amendment puts matters beyond doubt. I am very grateful to the committee for their scrutiny on this issue and to those who gave evidence. I agree with the witnesses about the importance of being as clear as possible and making every effort to ensure that survivors for whom the bill is intended are not excluded from its benefits. It is clear from the evidence that abuse which takes the form of childhood neglect can cause serious long-term damage and give rise to the same sort of difficulties that prevent survivors of other forms of childhood abuse coming forward to raise a civil action. At the consultation stage, there were concerns raised about whether there was a potential ambiguity in including neglect and the potential for a wider interpretation covering negligent acts that would not necessarily constitute abuse. However, neglect will be included only as a form of abuse. This makes it clear that the bill is not dealing with cases where a person has simply omitted or neglected to do a thing. At the same time, it removes any doubt as to whether actions arising from childhood abuse, abuse which takes the form of neglect will be able to benefit from the removal of the limitation period uh, brought about by the bill. I move amendment number one. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Can I um, open up for um, members to speak? Any member wishing to speak? To this amendment? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just very simply to welcome uh, this amendment being brought forward in response to observations of the committee. I, for my part, will find it very easy to support it. Likewise, um, I think the, the Minister is right in saying that an argument could be mounted for saying that neglect was covered in the previous wording, but I think as we've discussed and as we heard in evidence, the clarity that this bill uh, brings to, to survivors is absolutely crucial, and I think the amendment here delivers that, and I think uh, we heard that pretty strongly through the evidence we got, in particular from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, uh, and I think putting on record our, our, our gratitude to them for that evidence, but uh, I, like Stuart Stevenson, I will have no difficulty in supporting the amendment. Well, I, I would echo those remarks. Anyone else wanting to speak on that? No? Okay. In that case, um, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. We move on to Amendment 2 in the name of Douglas Ross in a group on its own. Can I ask Douglas Ross to move and speak to the amendment? Thank you, Deputy Convener. This amendment uh, aims to ensure that the bill is properly resourced. You will have seen uh, in our own committee report at paragraph 245, we inserted a recommendation uh, which was unanimously agreed by all members of this committee, which said, it is important that the bill is properly resourced to ensure both that its policy intent is achieved and to prevent any negative impact on the provision of current services by local authorities. By agreeing with the amendment I've submitted, today we ensure that is in the legislation and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Can I ask uh, Stuart Stevenson to speak to that amendment? Uh, thank you very much, Camilla. I note uh, that Mr Ross uh, during the stage one debate supported uh, the bill and its aims and he also said it's paramount survivors who had previously been unable to raise a civil action due to a time bar are not left frustrated and disappointed with the legislation because the Scottish Government continues put in place, ha, had not put in place the necessary resources to support um, any possible increase in actions. And he's just again properly highlighted the committee's conclusion about preventing a negative impacts on current services. But the amendment lays conditions on the government that if passed, mean the bill cannot be commenced by regulation. And that's because the tests in his amendment cannot be met. The first test in the amendment requires before commencement that, suf quote, sufficient financial and other resources have been made available uh, to meet any obligation, any obligation. 
Uh, since the effect of this bill, if passed by Parliament, is to create an enduring right without limit of time for individuals to act. For example, uh, as an unlikely but legally possible example, a person born in 2000 could take action in the year 2100 under this bill. And it's simply not possible to provide now the resources to support an action nearly a century hence. Uh, the second test that is within the amendment lies more generally, um, and I quote, any obligations arising from this act. Now, that unhelpfully captures obligations that might fall on all public bodies and all obligations, even where these arise solely from the actions or inactions of that public body uh, without... Uh, whereby they are responsible for providing financial recompense to victims. I don't think that's what Mr. Ross is seeking to do, but that is the effect, as I read it at least, of the words uh, that are in the amendment. So without engaging the policy issue, where I don't believe there is any difference between Mr. Ross and myself, the amendment that's before us it goes much further than that policy issue and de facto makes it impossible uh, to support the amendment in its present form. Um, it, it, it touches, of course, on the more general issue that arose uh, in the uh, stage one debate um, where Mr. Ross himself said the government must put in place necessary resources to support the possible increase in actions. And, of course, the difficulty with possible increase in actions is that the number could be almost anything. And indeed, the minister herself uh, pointed out that the 2,200 was the midpoint of a range of estimates between 400 and 4,000. And it was generally accepted that we could look at this for as long as we like without coming up with a number that was anything other than an estimate and an estimate range. So on that basis, I'm afraid I, I find myself uh, uh, unable to support this uh, amendment in the form it's been brought forward. Thank you. Uh, Liam, would you like to I think um, Stuart Stevenson fairly um, pointed out that I think there's policy agreement uh, around the, the concerns in relation to ensuring that um, the only way in which we will provide certainty is to ensure that the, uh, the financial wherewithal is, is, is there um, uh, to, to, to give effect um, where, where individuals do choose to go down the route of, of bringing cases. Now, um, I, as, as I would expect with um, Stuart Stevenson, he's done his due diligence in terms of the, uh, what he sees as the price, precise impact of this specific amendment, um, and, and that may very well be the, the, the case. Nevertheless, I think the, the amendment itself highlights an area where the, the legislation as it currently stands probably does need further clarification and reassurance to those that, who may be minded to bring forward uh, cases and therefore if not the wording of this specific amendment I would hope that the Minister would give uh, would reflect on what uh, is said the, the intent behind the amendment and potentially bring forward an amendment of her own uh, at stage three that the, uh, that the Parliament as a whole can, can consider at that point. Thank you. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I would align myself with a lot of the comments that Stuart Stevenson made, and I certainly wouldn't want to go into detail. Of course, it's entirely right that um, legislation that's passed is adequately resourced, but the whole essence of this is it's unknown, and this is intended to give a signal, and it's a signal of support to survivors that there's an opportunity. This is an evolving situation. I'm concerned that anything that would be seen that would frustrate the progress of this, and I certainly won't be supporting the amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Oliver. Yeah, um, I, I understand the technical points uh, that have been raised uh, by my colleague. However, I, I think uh, given the policy agreement, it would be advisable to include this amendment for the moment and to allow it to be refined at stage three when the bill returns. So I'll be supporting the amendment. Mm -hmm. Sorry, anyone else? Uh, okay. Um, well, for my part, I will not be supporting this amendment. I, I think that um, we can't do anything else that might delay the commencement of this act. I think the survivors have waited long enough. Um, I think, um, as been said throughout, throughout our evidence taking, it's impossible for us, or for anyone, to actually estimate what this is going to cause. And therefore, this amendment is unworkable. So I won't be supporting it. Anyone else? Minister, would you like to? Convener, 
Uh, the Scottish Government strongly opposes this amendment. What is proposed in this amendment is completely unworkable and could end up defeating the bill altogether. It is clear to me that we should not do anything that might delay the bill coming into force. And as uh, Rona Mackay has just said, survivors have waited long enough for this change in the law. Witnesses to the Justice Committee have accepted that it is not possible to estimate the impact in advance with any certainty. We simply will not know the impact of the bill until after it has come into force. It would therefore be premature to draw conclusions about resources without knowing the impact. Indeed, this amendment would put us in a catch-22 position. The impact will not be known until after commencement, but the amendment would not allow us to commence the act until the impact was known, or perhaps a blank cheque had been written. Hence, the conclusion that must be drawn is that the Act might never be commenced. It should, of course, be remembered that this bill does not change the law of delict and the duty of care. On top of that, as the Committee will appreciate, the current law does allow new claims to proceed where the Court considers it equitable to do so. That must be viewed, at least, as a potential liability for local authorities, which already exists, even aside from this bill. This bill is about access to justice for survivors. While we recognise that there will be financial implications for public bodies, that is the nature of civil litigation, we should not lose sight of the importance of the basic principle of removing an unfair barrier for survivors. Parliament has unanimously supported the general principles of the bill, and this amendment runs the risk of derailing the whole aim of the bill. We need to respect the outcome of the interaction process and, most importantly, respect survivors who have campaigned for this change for decades. Our public bodies, such as local authorities, provide valued public services, and I share the members' views about the importance of maintaining these at the highest standard. Of course, we are in regular uh, dialogue with COSLA and local government on a range of issues, and it would be open in the normal way of things to local authorities to raise concerns about any new and unplanned financial pressures they are facing which might impact on service delivery uh, so that we can consider together how these might be addressed. But that impact will not be the same from one local authority to another in terms of, for example, the number of cases and the position of any available insurance cover in any given case. So we don't yet know what the impact will be and nor can we know in advance of the implementation of the bill. I recently met the former children and young people spokesperson in COSLA, Stephanie Primrose, and it is clear that COSLA is not looking for a blank cheque. Rather, we agreed to continue the dialogue and to keep the situation under review. Once a new COSLA spokesperson has been elected on the 30th of June, I will seek a further meeting to discuss this issue. In conclusion, convener, I would say that this amendment does not provide a constructive solution. Rather, it would end up holding the bill hostage and could potentially derail the whole aim of the bill, which is to remove the insurmountable barrier to access to justice for survivors of childhood abuse that the three-year limitation period embodies. Uh, I urge members to reject Amendment 2. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Douglas Ross to wind up, please. Deputy Convener, and I think all of the speakers, with the ex exception of the Minister, uh, have accepted that the policy intent behind my amendment is not to derail things. And I think it's unfortunate that the Minister uh, spent most of her remarks looking at that aspect when I think Stuart Stevenson and others uh, were all accepting that the reason this amendment is going forward is because there is a deficiency in the legislation uh, which is in front of us. It's a deficiency that was accepted by every member of all parties on this committee when we no sorry not on that point uh, when we agreed at paragraph 245 as I said in my opening remarks that it was important that the bill is properly resourced it is quite clear uh, that it is not properly resourced and the biggest barrier to ensuring Sorry, not on that point, if I can continue, but uh, the most important point in ensuring that we get it right for victims is to ensure this legislation is properly resourced. The Scottish Government do have the opportunity uh, to do some scoping on this issue, and the Scottish Government must also take responsibility. We heard from a number of witnesses um, when we met with um, representatives from COSLA and local authorities that there were concerns over uh, other services being uh, 
cut and reduced to pay for the potential impacts of this legislation. Finally, I think it is important that we uh, highlight the deficiency uh, in the legislation with uh, particular respect to my amendment. And while I accept some of the um, issues that have been raised by Stuart Stevenson and others. Uh, if my amendment is agreed at committee today, it will become part of the stage two bill, which can then be further amended at stage three. So for that reason, I would seek to press the amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, in that case, um, I'll ask the question, uh, is amendment two, will amendment two be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. no. Uh, there's a division, so we will move, move to a vote. All those in favour? All those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. So the totals are three for the amendment, seven against the amendment, and one abstention. So we can move on. Uh, the question is that section two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that section three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. The question is that long the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you. Thank, can I thank the minister for attending and her officials? Should have been in the commuter's brief, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> she remained to see that, yeah. which is uh, feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of the 18th of May 2017. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for comments or questions. Can I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk? And I invite Mary Fee to provide feedback. Thank you, um, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 18th of May when it held an evidence session on the governance of the Scottish Police Authority. The subcommittee heard from Andrew Flanagan, the Chair, and John Foley, Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority. And this was a late change to business in response to the recent serious governance concerns raised by the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. Andrew Flanagan apologised for his letter to Moy Alley and told the subcommittee that he regretted not circulating the letter from HMICS to board members. The chair and the chief executive answered questions from the subcommittee on governance issues. And the next meeting of the subcommittee is scheduled for Thursday the 25th of May when it will consider its report on governance of the Scottish Police Authority. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, convener. Any questions? Sure. John Finney. For a comment and a question, I, I, I thought it was a very useful um, session, um, and it was, as, as um, our convener of the subcommittee said, was to address concerns. I have to say these concerns were not allayed by anything I heard, quite the reverse. We subsequently learned that, um, as we were told by Mr Flanagan, that the, the a copy of his letter had been emailed. Yes, um, it had been emailed, but a quarter of an hour before our meeting commenced. And, and I have to say, um, it's a matter of concern to me that, um, um, whilst Mr Flanagan certainly believed that uh, he was taking an appropriate position now, it didn't seem to me, and subsequent information about the timing of his emailed letter to Ms Moy suggested um, that he had learnt very much at all from it. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? On those that were there? Liam? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... Uh, John fairly sums up where we probably got to by the end of the, the session. I think what was also not entirely clear was um, uh, the extent to which uh, other board members feel able to um, either comment publicly or, or sort of speak truth to power. Um, and uh, while we got offered some reassurances around that, I think the evidence um, was, was less convincing and, and therefore 
Um, I think it was, as John says, a very useful session, but the, the, uh, the concerns largely, largely remain. Yeah, I, I would echo those comments. I, that, that was, I was left with that feeling that yeah. I wasn't reassured uh, that things would you know, greatly change. Um, but we'll wait with interest to see how that, that pans out. Yes, I mean, I, th I think everyone on the committee um, shared the, the same concerns. Mm -hmm. I mean, while Andrew Flanagan um, appeared c contrite, um, I did ask him the question while uh, and he, he accepted that he had been wrong in some of the decisions that he had taken, but there is a difference between accepting you are wrong and believing you are wrong. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I came away from the session not fully confident they actually believed um, that he had acted in a way that was um, inappropriate. And there are ongoing issues of, of governance that the subcommittee will be looking at. Thank you. Any other comments? OK. Well, that concludes our 19th meeting of 2017. At our next meeting on the 30th of May, we'll continue evidence taking on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. Thank you.